<laughs> Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Did you guys enjoy the rain this last week? Wasn't that wonderful? It's like, wow, you just kind of want to go, almost wanted to go out and play in it, but it was a lot easier to sit on the porch and look at it. But uh, nevertheless, I think I, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I have one announcement. Uh, this Tuesday evening at 6.30, we're going to have a uh, congregational meeting and we're going to have some leadership from both the Presbyterian side and the United Methodist side to come and uh, begin a process of uh, exploring where God is calling us to go as a congregation. So be a time of visioning and really looking forward to uh, meeting some, uh, some folks I've had a little bit of conversation with and uh, I think we're really have a very positive situation that we can explore together. So I hope all are welcome. This is not just a handful of people. Anybody who is interested in really the future of the Bridge Church Fellowship and uh, our service to God's kingdom, I are welcome and encouraged to come. So, all right, are there any announcements? Mr. Bob. You bet. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. That's who we are and what we're about. Did you, did you say when you, did you say when you were in, you were in sixth grade? Wow. Wonderful. All right. Very good. Sounds grand. All right. Anything else? My friends, would you please uh, stand as you are able and join with me in our opening hymn, Oh, Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Oh. 
join me in reading responsively our call to worship. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. Do this and you will live. Let us worship God. Holy God, you call us to live out your justice and righteousness. Help us to walk in your footsteps so that we never lose our way. Enable us to live and love in the way that you have taught us so that we can act in grace even with those who we consider our enemies. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The psalmist asks a question, how long? How long will we live unjustly and show partiality instead of loving as God has loved us? Trusting in that love, let us confess our transgressions to the Lord. Would you please join with me in our prayer of confession? Holy God, we are your sons and daughters, descendants of the God Most High, yet we do not behave to honor you, and our actions belittle the love you have for us. We do not defend the weak or those without fathers or mothers. We do not uphold the poor or the oppressed. We do not commit to enforce to rescue the weak and the needy. Rescue, sorry. We sometimes deliver them into solitude and neglect. Rise up to judge us, O God. We prefer your merciful justice than living with guilt and fear. Strengthen our path so that we may be guided as a mother or a father guides her beloved children. Amen. The triune God's unconditional love does not seek appearances or conditions, but loves in such a way that we are restored to health and to wholeness. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As a redeemed people, we live for giving thanks. We understand that everything we do and everything we have comes from God, whose unconditional love lifted us up each day. Let us continue our thanksgiving with grateful hearts by giving of what God has provided. This is our time of offering. Please stand. As a redeemed people, we live for giving thanks. We understand that everything we do and everything we have comes from God, whose unconditional love lifts us up each day. Let us continue our thanksgiving with grateful hearts by giving us what God has provided. You may be seated. Yep, okay. <laughs> this is our time of celebration, time of joys and concerns. Any celebrations this morning?
67, huh? 62. Wonderful. How about that? So, and you guys partied last night and you came to church this morning. We partied and we laughed. We were out there night. He went to bed late this last night. <laughs> Oh my, how life changes as we get older, doesn't it? Oh, what, oh my. Any other uh, joys or concerns this morning? All right, well, I have a few that, oh, go ahead, Pam. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Stephanie is starting a week at diabetes camp. And so children will be coming today and staying through Friday at the camp at Monticello, and all of them are type 1 diabetics. And she is the head nurse this year. And I just want you to pray for all the uh, staff and the children. It is all volunteer. Uh, oh. All the medical professionals are volunteer. And they were kind of not sure about doing it this year, and they kind of didn't, you know, they had to go for it even though things weren't really smooth. So just pray for all the staff and all the kids. Because, you know, you know, when you think us let our children come to camp. We're nervous enough, but if your child's tired, then they Yeah. Serious stuff. Amen. Thank you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Um, I'd like to lift up a, a few. I got a call. Uh, I got a call Friday from my cousin Fred, who was the oldest of my generation, and uh, his uh, wife Jean passed last Friday. And uh, they live out in Washington State, and I just really had some nice back and forth with him. We, uh, I just uh, pray kindness upon him and his family and loved ones. Also, I have a gentleman who I met many years ago, let's say about seven years ago, just about the time I came here. I had been doing hospice work, and uh, I, his wife was in our hospice uh, and so I met him as she was dying. His name is uh, Philip Hoggett. Uh, Hoggett lives in Champaign. And he just got some good news about cancer treatment that uh, is a relief. So I just want to say thank you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear Amen. our prayers. And I also want to lift up my daughter, Sheila, who uh, I was with her the last two weeks as she moved from basically a three-bedroom <coughs> home uh, private residents to uh, living in an RV about 85 miles out on a farm that she what she called it so life made a pretty radical change and uh, I'm just praying that it will be a blessing for her so Lord in your mercy hear our prayers and uh, I think we really just need to lift up our nation uh, the divisiveness the divisiveness of just the political conversation, the health issues, there's just so many, it's, uh, it's almost exhausting to think about the struggles that we as a nation face and really the world also. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And, uh, pardon? Yes, I'm sorry, Angela, yes. One more, too, if you could, Kendall, cousin Kendall. Yes. Uh, hopefully before uh, they need to take the baby. So wow. keep her in prayers, please. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Well, yes, yeah, Richard. Marla, Judy, and really everyone who has COVID or being touched to this COVID outbreak. Yeah. Um, please pray for them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I got a message from Marla this morning. This is their last day for quarantine, so... Uh, uh, good news is she'll be able to be here Tuesday for our meeting. I think that's really important for anyone that's uh, be present for that. And uh, they're doing better. So that's good news, really good news. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is from uh, Colossians, the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother 
to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ and Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work, and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, so that you may have all endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of these words. And our hymn this morning is number 337, Only Trust Him.
Our gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your might and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my brother, my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Jesus said. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hand of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went on to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. When he had put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, what color do you think the uh, first ambulance in the Bible was? Ever th never thought about that, right? So who knows? It was probably, though, gray or brown because you see, it was a donkey. That was the first ambulance. Today our scripture talks about a need and who God used to fill that need. It wasn't probably the person you would have expected. It was a Samaritan, the most unlikely person to help a Jewish person. For there was this deep hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews saw themselves as the pure descendants of Abraham and the Samaritans, well, they were a mixed race produced when the Jews from the Northern Kingdom intermarried with the other people after the uh, exile, Israel's exile. So for the Jews, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan, didn't exist. The scripture opens with a lawyer an expert in the Jewish law, asking Jesus to, a question to test him. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I don't know how sincere he is in making this question, asking this question. Maybe he was just trying to trip Jesus up. But Jesus responds with a question of his own. What does the law say? How do you understand it? So Jesus was not trying to put him on the spot or embarrass him because the lawyer knew exactly what the law said. His reply, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Every Jewish person was taught that from the very beginning of life, the most important. Jesus said to him, yes, that's right. and." Uh, do this and you will live. But as we know, there is this other question that leads from it, right? And the man asked it, just who is my neighbor? Have you ever really given any thought for yourself? You know, as we go through this, we've all heard this. We've heard this scripture. It's one of those that is the most famous or most recognized by persons, not just in church, but persons in the secular world out there. You know, you think of the Good Samaritan Inn and how many other, uh, there's a, I think a hospital in uh, Mattoon called the Good Samaritan Hospital. It's a, it is a name that is common, right? When we think about the Good Samaritan, we do ask that question, who is my neighbor? So just then, 
Uh, Jesus told this parable or story to answer the man's question. There's this uh, scene open somewhere on this way between, on a road between Jerusalem and Jericho. It's about a 17 mile stretch that is rocky and rugged and dangerous. There are robbers. It is a very dangerous path. And uh, there is this priest who was returning from Jerusalem where he'd been observing the law and doing, performing his priestly duties. His highest duty was to offer sacrifices in the temple. And according to the law in Leviticus 21, he was to keep himself ceremonially clean and not to be defile himself. This was a very important thing, to not touch those who are wounded. There's a long list of issues that could defile him and make him unclean, and he was to avoid all of those. So, even though he had certain rules and regulations, there wasn't any reason he could not show mercy to this man who was in need. Luke 6 says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Deuteronomy 22 is a law that states that people were to help a person's animal get back up if it had fallen. And we see in Exodus that even an enemy's donkey or ax that has fallen must be helped up. So there's reasons he could have helped, but he did not. Then there's the Levite who uh, assisted the priests in the temple service and uh, was also a person set apart and trained for religious work. I kind of take that a little bit as maybe like an associate pastor in some of our churches or uh, those who have special positions of assisting in the leadership of a local congregation. And then finally we have this uh, Samaritan, the outcast. He's a Gentile who was low on the totem pole as far as status or, res or respect. Here we have it. We have a priest, a Levite, a Samaritan. That's kind of our cast of characters here. Uh, and it leaves one more person. A man was going down to Jericho from Jerusalem on this dangerous road and some robbers beat him and left him for dead. We don't know anything about him. The priest happens to come by and looks over and saw the hurting man. We don't have much information about what he saw or felt as he happened along. Uh, he may have said something like, mm, I feel sorry for that guy. He's probably about dead anyway. Maybe he's already dead. Anyway, what can I do to help? I'm not a paramedic. I better get out of here and that will be me or that will be me lying in the ditch next time. So, he leaves. He certainly didn't want to become a victim and that was a place where that could have happened. Whatever he felt, he didn't feel about the man in the ditch. He shut it out by walking over to the other side of the road so that he could avoid being even involved. He saw, but he did not want to see. He may have even looked the other way. He thought, don't know what happened, but I don't care what happened. That's basically it. Ever had any of those moments in your life? where you see something that could invite you in and you really just kind of turn away because there's more going on there than you feel comfortable becoming involved in. So, when we've uh, reacted just like the priest did, avoiding getting involved, if I don't see the need, I can't be expected to stop, right? And if we can justify our lack of involvement because we might be in danger or at risk, we can often scoot to the other side of the road and go on our way with ease. If we tell ourselves that we can't do anything about it anyway, it often gets us off the hook and we can feel okay about it. I'm struck by that one. There are so many issues we, we had in our Sunday school class, got into struggling with the issues, uh, health, police, all, just there are so many issues in our life in the culture that we live in. I don't know about you guys, but I sometimes feel overwhelmed and feel pretty helpless, right? I'm guessing most of us do. The issues are big, they're serious. And on the one hand, we may be, God may be tugging at our heart uh, to open our eyes, but nevertheless, 
they're overwhelming and we don't want to get involved because we may feel powerless, you know? Mark 12 talks about loving God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself also, but his scripture adds this thought, that this is a more important than all burned offerings and sacrifices. The priest who considers himself the very religious was missing this point. We often do too at times when we fail to have concern for others in need. It's important. You know, even those times when we pray, if we pray for others as we see, we are engaging somehow in some connectedness with another person. The second person, this Levite, also saw the need and quickly passed by on the other side. We don't know how much time had passed between these two folks, seeing but not doing anything about the need. He didn't call 911 or make contact with anyone else who could help. The need was passed by, unmet by people who probably could have done something to help. So how many times do we see the need but pass by on the other side of the road? Probably a whole lot more times than we would like to admit, and for a number of reasons. I think this scripture shows us how many times we too, as Christians, have walked on the other side of the road. We may feel condemned about it and say, but I'm just, I'm just not a person who can do anything about this. So, there's a story. There's a story about a preacher who wouldn't talk to people. He would walk by them and not even say, hi, how's your day? People would say, oh, he's very businesslike. He's uh, just not like people. He doesn't particularly like people. Maybe the priest and the Levite were trying to act like that. Who knows what was going on with them. But we may not feel, you and I may not feel like we are the good Samaritan either. You know, we've heard this story. We know what it, where, what's being asked of us and we may have resistance to that. Jesus did not tell this parable to beat us over the head with condemnation because of what we are or what we aren't. He told this parable to teach us, to try to help us to grasp this concept that members of the kingdom of God help others, even those who are different than themselves. You know, we are all God's children. The third man, third man probably the most unqualified of all, responded in nine additional ways. This is the Samaritan, the good Samaritan. First of all, he saw the need. But what then? He didn't walk to the other side of the road and keep on walking. We don't know if he argued with himself about making a decision whether or not to stop. He could have said, I don't want to be on this road after dark. Anyway, I've got a million things on my schedule today. I can't take time to do this. I've got everything prioritized and this is not on my list of stuff. He's got a lot of options to, to buy out, right? The scripture says he saw the need and he took pity on, had compassion for, and the message uh, says, calls it this. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out of him. He connected. He connected to another human being in need. As we desire to use, be used by the Lord, we will give us greater sensitivity to people's needs. I think that's one of the first gifts of the Spirit. You know, as we respond to God's relationship that's offered through Christ, we begin to see a bigger picture and we begin to have some compassion for those around us. Oftentimes that compassion comes from our own life's experiences that have been tough, you know? The things that have caused us pain and hurt open our eyes to the pain and hurt of other people. And sometimes we even learn some ways to, that might help them to, to find healing or to cope. No. As we desire to be used by the Lord, we will give us, He will give us a greater sensitivity to people's needs. That's how it works. 
We can say, if I can be a good Samaritan on my time schedule, I'll be one. We don't want to say that. But if I'm expected to be a good Samaritan at an inconvenient time, count me out. What do you think? How does this work? I, uh, I find for myself, I drive uh, 51 North and South, Water Street or Main Street, a lot. That's kind of our pattern, I think. I, and it's not at all unusual to uh, see folks flying a sign, it's called. You know, they're asking for help, asking for financial help nearly always. Kind of pokes my heart a little bit, and I wonder. I can't say that I stop and give money, but I, I also feel this something inside that says, what do we do to help? What do we do to really help? You know, it's a genuine issue. And I think that we see other issues. The world around us is pain and broken. And how can you and I as brothers and sisters actually make a difference, you know? Um, I, sometimes these, I don't know where these take you, but it seems like in this story, the Samaritan helps the man, not only helps him, but takes him basically to uh, safety, provides financial resources so that he has a place to stay and to be fed and cared for, you know. There's this financial cost. What a beautiful gift that was to be able to, to, be able to do that. Um, but not always, not always is the giving of oneself to the neighbor who you don't know. Not always is that about financial stuff. As much as anything, there are a lot of times when, when we are really hurting, when life has dealt us a pretty serious blow, however that works out. Sometimes the gift of just being recognized and cared for in a respectful way is very, very important. And that, my friends, we can do. That we can learn to do. I, uh, I was reminded as I was reflecting on this about 35 years ago, the second crisis of my life had everything fell apart, everything. I was living with my parents in Lincoln again, second time. And it was just, I had no clue what the future held because everything that I had worked so very hard for uh, collapsed. I had, uh, I, I was going to a uh, Wednesday morning men's Bible study, small group, whatever you want to call it. And there was a gentleman named Russ Lilly, this old retired guy. He would pick me up on Wednesday mornings and we'd go down to Hardy's and he'd buy me a little breakfast sandwich and we'd go to our Bible study and we did that for a long time. And I had a friend named Chuck Wilson who was one of those folks at that Bible study. Uh, eventually Chuck asked me if I would go on a spiritual retreat called Walk to Emmaus. You have heard me talk about Walk to Emmaus, so you're all acquainted with that. That was a time of radical change in my life. Not because somebody gave me something, but because somebody cared and showed respect, even as life was looking like failure, you know? I think that's a part of loving your neighbor. It's just the ability to care and to respect for those who are different and try to do that in such a way that they recognize we do care about them. It's genuine. It's not some phony thing, you know? And we can do that. We really can. And it may be far more meaningful than some of the other acts that we may have. Amen. Amen. I would like, we're going to, uh, this is our time of communion, and uh, we're going to begin with a, uh, a 
hymn that we have sung before in remembrance of me. And I would invite you, my friends, to uh, be in an attitude of prayer as we share this sacred meal that Christ himself initiated. It is a foundation of our faith. This morning we sang about the blood of Jesus, didn't we, Pam? You know, it's the sacrifice that Christ Jesus made on the cross for you and for me and for those eons of uh, folks who came before us that passed the faith down to us and those who will come after us, you know? It's the God's way of saying, I love you. You are mine. I claim you. Okay. Okay, if you want to look in the black book, you don't have to. This song um, is on page 2254, and you sing the first two verses. You sing the first verse, go back to the top, sing the second verse, then it goes on, and then you go back and sing the third verse. Do we have a slide for that by any chance, Ben? I think. Pardon? The, the next thing I have is this. Thought I, did I not do that? Uh, I thought that I had. Uh, What's the number? Two two five four. Two two five four. I'm sorry, I really. I th okay, it I might thought, be after. There. Huh? Yeah, that's what I'm looking. No. In remembrance of me. Yes. Yes, I found it. We'll have to skip around a little bit because it's backwards. Or in the black. There we go. Yes.
<laughs> All right. I think. Sorry. I think Jesus laughed. I do. <laughs> All right. Will you please join with me in our liturgy? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who look for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, 